Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And I'd like to talk today about the question of whether people who wish to remain in the European Union in 2016 should now be talking about rejoining. There are a number of um, prominent um, commentators and politicians um, who think that now is not the appropriate time to talk about rejoining the European Union. The particular example of this that most people have in mind is Keir Starmer's pledge that the Labour Party is following the line uh, of wishing to make Brexit work. Uh, I want to analyse and consider uh, these arguments and uh, come to the conclusion, I'm afraid, that they're not particularly persuasive, that um, those people who want to rejoin the European Union should have no hesitation in saying so now. The general point that I'd like to make, probably before saying anything else, is that uh, silence um, on the part of Remainers and rejoiners is precisely what the most eager Brexiters want to have happen. Uh, it's their interest to say that the matter has been resolved once and for all, uh, and that anybody who isn't moving on, hasn't caught cut up with the programme, uh, is remoning, re um, can be safely disregarded. It's always a good idea, it seems to me, to do what your opponent doesn't want you to do and not to do what your opponent does want you to do. So one should look with some scepticism at the idea that rejoin should be a taboo word. Uh, that's particularly so today um, and this year indeed, when it's becoming daily clearer um, that damage is being done by Brexit to the United Kingdom. And that damage has to some extent been concealed by the, the COVID pandemic over the past uh, 18 months. Uh, I think there are three kinds of principal damage that are being done to the United Kingdom and the malign effects of which can only be reversed by reversing Brexit. Uh, those, um, dam that damage is economic, constitutional and political. The economic damage speaks for itself. Uh, every day we hear of um, new groups of people, farmers, uh, fishermen, um, seafood sea producers, financial agents, ski instructors, uh, people with second homes in, in, in continental Europe um, who are feeling the difficulties of um, Brexit. We had a, a study the other day that it might be 4% uh, over a period of time in lost the economic growth that's caused by Brexit. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's rather more um, because there are, there are dynamic effects of being outside of the European Union. Um, people sometimes say that the effect of Brexit is that of a slow puncture. Well, slow punctures eventually become very rapid punctures. And I don't think um, that we're at the end yet of the, the problems that are caused to the British economy by Brexit. It's significant that the um, advocates of Brexit um, don't even anymore pretend that it's an economic success. Uh, they either say that the successes will come in 50 years' time, well beyond the lifetime of most people in, in public life now, um, or, and this is a particularly um, insidious version of events, um, that the European referendum in 2016 wasn't about economics, it was about um, sovereignty, it was about um, free, freeing our borders. Now, it's true. Um, that sovereignty, national identity and protection of borders were important factors within the referendum campaign. But what is not true is that uh, the economic aspect of Brexit was understated or ignored by those who advocated Brexit. Um, all the Brexit advocates said that Britain would either be um, economically benefited or at least not harmed by the economic consequences of Brexit. Um, it's a, a, a very strange rewriting of history now um, to claim uh, that British people voted um, to leave the European Union in the belief that there will be negative economic consequences coming from it. One particularly interesting variant of this, um, of this confusion is the claim of David Frost recently that what people voted for was Singapore on Thames, they voted for a highly deregulated United Kingdom within the Europe, outside the European economy. Um, this is um, complete um, fantasy. 
Uh, particularly the people in the Red Wall seat certainly didn't vote for a, a deregulated economy. Um, I think um, the desperation with which some Eurosceptics, some Brexiters, uh, are now looking for a justification of, of, um, of Brexit, of what they've done, um, reminds me of Churchill's claim that a, a fanatic is somebody who, when he's got what he wanted, um, has, to, has forgotten the reasons which impelled him to look for it in the first place, and he has to make new ones up. So on the economic side, that there, there are clear, substantial downsides to Brexit. And perhaps more important um, are the other two um, con uh, considerations I want to, to put forward, um, constitutional and political. Uh, constitutionally, um, the United Kingdom has been thrown into a state of flux, um, which would have been inconceivable without Brexit. If you look at the Scottish situation, uh, it was thought that the referendum of 2014 uh, had resolved once and for all, or for a generation, the question of Scottish independence. Uh, it's only Brexit which has given new legs to this issue. And the argument that um, Scotland is being taken out of the European Union against its will um, is a powerful one, because both Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland uh, voted against Brexit. And the fact that they are being taken willy-nilly out of the European Union is a, a, a proof for many in both Northern Ireland and Scotland um, that the United Kingdom is not a union of equals. It's a union um, dictated by, by the vagaries of, um, and the whims of, of Westminster. I personally think that there will be a, a referendum in Scotland in the not too distant future. I'm not sure what its result will be. But whatever its result, it will be destabilizing. It might be very like the Brexit um, uh, outcome, that there would be a narrow majority for remaining, and that would leave a, a permanently estranged um, minority in Scotland. Uh, something similar might well happen in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, I think that um, the, the possibility of a referendum um, is daily coming closer. And I think that if there were a referendum, it might well lead to a, a unified um, Ireland. Uh, it's certainly clear that over the past um, 18 months in particular, the British government has taken no interest in the long-term welfare of Northern Ireland. It's simply regarded Northern Ireland as being a plaything, as being a lever which it can deploy in its um, European negotiations. Um, Boris Johnson had very little intention, it seems to me, of ever implementing the, um, the Northern Ireland Protocol. It used to be said that... Um, the British had spent many centuries trying to show, solve the Irish problem. Uh, and then when they thought they solved it, the Irish changed the question. Um, that certainly isn't the case now. It's the British who've changed the question, wanting to renege on um, uh, an agreement that they came to uh, of their own free accord. The third um, damage of Brexit uh, is perhaps the most um, important from my point of view. Uh, which is that of the degradation of our political culture, which comes about uh, as a result of the, the lies and fantasy upon which Brexit was based. Um, Brexit is not simply another political choice which you can agree or disagree with. It was a, a fundamental reordering of our economic and political position within the world uh, based on, on lies, on, on uh, exaggerations, on fantasy, on propaganda, um, with more than a hint of um, outside influences, um, which had a, a, a malign effect. Um, now, that um, has led many in the Conservative Party, the Conservative government, its supporters, to conclude that far from honesty being the best policy, policy dishonesty is the best policy because it seems to work. Um, we've had today, or we had yesterday, um, the uh, issue of Boris Johnson um, finally remembering whether he'd attended a party or not, and the um, decision of the High Court uh, that uh, the VIP um, uh, procedure, um, which was envisaged for the allocation of contract tax for anti-COVID protective clothing, um, what was illegal. Both of those are enormously serious issues. And while it looks as if the, the question of the party may haunt Boris Johnson for a little longer, um, I'd be surprised if it leads to his resignation. Um, 
but uh, there's a, a, a shrugging indifference uh, to mendacity um, on much of the part of much of the electorate, uh, much of the um, media commentators these days, um, which is extraordinarily dangerous to democracy. It's the idea that you can't expect any better of politicians. And that, of course, is uh, absolutely advantageous um, to the villains um, who, among the politicians um, who think that they will benefit from the misconception in the populace uh, that nobody is any better than other anybody else in the political world. So uh, I think that the burden of proof, given um, the, this damage which is being done to, to Britain by, by, the, um, by Brexit, um, ought to be on those who want to say, uh, let's not try to re re reverse it, or at least not talk about reversing it. And uh, a number of arguments are, are put forward. One argument that you sometimes hear is that um, British public opinion um, needs to settle down. Um, there aren't prepared to listen to arguments about um, rejoining the European Union. All that we need to do is say how badly and repeatedly uh, say how badly the, Europe, the Brexit is going. Um, and eventually people gradually um, will have their, their views confirmed um, that they should look for a closer relationship with the European Union and finally perhaps conclude we should rejoin. Um, but it, it would be premature and even counterproductive um, now to attempt um, to mount any sort of campaign or any sort of intellectual effort um, to justify rejoining. Uh, I find that a, a strange um, analysis and conclusion to come to. Um, after all, we're told that 50% um, of the electorate, um, in opinion polls, um, now think uh, that um, Brexit was a mistake. Um, those opinion, that opinion um, has been gaining ground considerably over, over recent months. Um, and I think that process is um, gaining momentum. Uh, there is no political party at the moment, major political party, um, apart from the SNP, who wants Scottish independence within the European Union, um, that wants the United Kingdom to rejoin the, the EU um, in terms that are unambiguous. 50% uh, of the electorate are, are unrepresented, therefore. Um, it's an extraordinary state of affairs. In 2010, nobody could have foreseen that in 2016, very few people could have foreseen, foreseen that in 2016, we would be leaving the European Union. Uh, and yet uh, UKIP and its allies um, was absolutely determined to push their message, to push across their ideas. Um, and they had um, what they must regard as their reward um, as a result of, of their conviction and determination. Uh, I can't see um, that in any sense it, it will be counterproductive um, to advocate um, uh, rejoining the European Union if that's what you think is in the national interest. It might be a question for political parties, how they approach the European issue, um, but for individuals, for commentators, and for lobby groups of one kind and another, I, I think that it's, um, uh, it's uh, unnecessarily cautious um, not to be advocating rejoining the European Union as soon as may be. And of course, as soon as may be is, is a variable feast because we come to the second argument that sometimes put forward, um, those within the European Union um, wouldn't want us back. Uh, and therefore it's a waste of time even thinking about it. Uh, I once again uh, find that a, a, a strange argument. Uh, we won't know whether they want us back uh, unless we put the question, faint heart never won fair lady. Uh, and simply to um, put off again and again asking whether we can come back into the European Union um, is, is never going to make um, a spontaneous offer come forth from the European Union. Uh, it's sometimes said that the terms of our rejoining the European Union would be unacceptable. Well, um, we don't know what those terms will be until we change the equation by having a government that wants to rejoin the European Union. Uh, at the moment, the governing party of the, the Conservatives certainly don't want to rejoin the European Union. They want to have as little as possible to do with the European Union. Uh, and their hostility to and friction with the European Union is an important reason why at the moment it wouldn't be possible for us to rejoin the European Union. But if we had a government that did want to rejoin the European Union, 
the equation would have been changed. Some people say uh, that the reason why the rest of the European Union would not want us back is that uh, they would be afraid that in five years time after our rejoining, um, the United Kingdom would have a conservative government or another government uh, which would take a different view and want to leave again. I think there is something in that argument, um, but it's not a, 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 an overwhelming one. Uh, if we did get to the position where we had a government uh, which wanted to rejoin the European Union, many, many things would have been different in British politics. Um, we can't postpone indefinitely until the circumstances are absolutely right uh, any consideration or any action uh, on our part um, that might provoke, bring about uh, rejoining. My old employer at the Foreign Office for some time uh, uh, accused of only having two policies uh, when asked what they should do with regard to Peru or Hong Kong. Um, and they would say, um, it's too early to say, Minister, it's, or it's too late to do anything about it. Um, and there will be very little between in, in time between those two pieces of advice. But if we do nothing about it, if we allow ourselves to be deterred, then we won't find out what are the circumstances in which we might be able to rejoin. A third proposition which is sometimes put forward uh, is that um, the United Kingdom shouldn't be in favour at the moment of rejoining, um, but should attempt um, to proceed by, by steps, by, by stages of joining the single market uh, and the customs union. And then in the due course, coming to review the question of rejoining. Uh, I think this would be politically quite hard to sell to the United Kingdom's electorate because it would be very vulnerable to the criticism um, that the United Kingdom was turning itself into a rule taker rather than a rule maker. It was having to pool its sovereignty um, without being part of the decision making uh, of, um, of the European Union. If um, the joining of the Customs Union and the single market is, is to be uh, a definite prelude to rejoining the European Union, um, I can't see the point of it. If it's anything other than that, then I think it will be, as I say, difficult to sell politically uh, and also will open um, the rejoin um, uh, contingent, the rejoin side of the argument um, to the uh, criticism um, that they are trying to bring about by the back door, by stealth, the um, uh, rejoining of the European Union. Um, I think that's a, a dangerous view to have uh, among the British electorate, uh, because there is some truth in the claim that Britain's political leaders, even those who were in favour of remaining in the European Union, were not always straightforward with the electorate, the British electorate, about the sovereignty sharing, which is at the heart of the European Union. Um, there was a, a thought that we could have a cake and eat it, that we could be in the European Union, and yet somehow, by all our marvellous opt-outs, um, less affected by the European Union than others. Uh, this opened the door to the reflection that uh, if these opt-outs are so good, why don't we opt out of the whole thing? And I'm afraid there were too many people who drew that conclusion in the referendum of 2016. So I, I in summary, um, don't think that the case has been made out for saying that there's advantage in refusing to talk about rejoining the European Union. I think that... Um, Many people who uh, are reluctant to talk about rejoining the Euro European Union anyway uh, are seen uh, by Brexiters uh, as in fact wanting to, to rejoin the European Union. They're, they're not persuading many people um, that they are genuinely chewing uh, any uh, prospect of rejoining the European Union. Um, I think um, we might as well be, or they, those who favour rejoin, uh, might as well be honest about it. Um, and uh, honesty, in some cases, is the best policy, um, because those people who hold a view um, which they're reluctant um, to articulate, reluctant to publicise, um, don't, don't gain thereby the respect of the electorate. Uh, on the contrary, they gain the electorate's contempt. Uh, to their credit, UKIP spent 25 years in the wilderness, but never giving up, and always thinking that uh, an articulation, a clear articulation um, of their own views, of their own goals, um, was something that would eventually chime with the British electorate. I don't know, nobody knows when the United Kingdom will rejoin the European Union, but I do know that 
the sooner we get talking about it, the sooner we get it as a matter of discourse and public discussion, the sooner it's likely to happen. Because if we do nothing about it on the basis that at the time's wrong um, or um, none, uh, the European partners won't be interested, then it will become uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, if we think we're never going to join the European Union, then we never are. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, I hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.